effect he had on our lives. <clears throat> we were young and in love, newly wedged, just starting out on life's, joy life's voyage together. Jenny and I had recently moved into the perfect little house with the perfect little yard in back. We sanded and varnished the wood floors and painted the windowsills. Jenny sewed curtains, I planted flowers. Life seemed about as grand as life could get. Then, we brought home Marley. When he arrived, he was just this a tiny little yellow fur ball about the size of Zoe there. A squiggly Labrador Retriever puppy with stylish black liner around his eyes and ears so comically oversized. They looked like he'd borrowed them from an elephant at the circus. Right from the start, he was a total handful. On his very first five minutes in the house, he ran in the bathroom, ran out 30 seconds later, trailing the roll of toilet paper behind him. He galloped to the front door to greet guests, carrying his sloshing water ball, water flying everywhere. People think I made this stuff up, but if you open the inside cover of the book, you'll see a picture of Marley galloping down the hall with his water ball in his mouth. We just routinely started leaving beach towels around on the floor. We really did, so whenever he ran by, we just put our foot on the beach towel and kind of wipe off the after him. He devoured shoes and watches and eyeglasses. He shredded pillows and with beaver-like efficiency, chewed the corners off cherished family heirlooms. On the, corner of the, on the cover of the book is a picture of Marley that's really him as about a 12-week-old puppy. Behind him, you'll see there's this little uh, blue footstool that was a cherished family hand-me-down in Jenny's family. You notice I used the past tense with that. Um, one day we went to work and there was this little four-legged footstool sitting there. When we got home, the four-legged footstool now was suddenly a three-legged footstool. There were no wood chips, no splinters, nothing. It was just God. Marley never even showed any signs of indigestion. He grew at an alarming rate. Soon, our cute little puppy with a 97-pound steamroller of pure, unbridled, unruly energy. He tried to be good, and really he did. He wanted to please us, but he just could not control that seismic exuberance of his. Marley slammed into our lives like a hurricane, turning them upside down, just as we were trying to figure out what those lives would be. We were like any other newlywed couple. You're taking two lives and you're trying to blend them into one, and we didn't know what we were doing, and Marley came into that equation. He changed us forever. We tried obedience school. The teacher expelled us at the conclusion of the second lesson. <laughs> After Marley dragged her ingloriously across the tarmac as she desperately shrieked, Heal! Heal! <laughs> That'll teach her to have an uppity personality. The veterinarian diagnosed him as hyperactive with attention deficit disorder thrown at him. <laughs> and urged us to take immediate steps to stop his gene line. <laughs> so, of course, Jenny, being a woman, she was fine with this. Yeah, let's do that. Let's have him neuter. I was, I was feeling a little guilty. So the day came for his neutering operation, and we whistled for him, and he comes bounding out to the car, jumps right in for his, going for a ride in the car with his master and mistress, and I was feeling really guilty, like he has no idea where we're taking him. <laughs> and Jenny's driving, it's a little tiny, you know, Toyota with bucket seats, and Marley would always put his shoulders right between the two bucket seats with his feet resting on the emergency brakes. In this way, every time she tapped the brakes, he would go crashing head first into the windshield. But it, he never got the head, he'd get right back up again. The first time we turned a corner, crash again. We're driving down the road to the veterinarians, and I'm feeling bad, so I roll the window down and I'll give him a little fresh air. And he crawls across me in the passenger seat, and he's sticking his nose out the window. And he looks so darn happy that I think, well, I'm going to give him a little more. So I roll it down, and now he has his whole head out. And his ears are flapping back, and he's having a great time. And I think, you know, this is his last ride as a fully equipped male. <laughs> What the heck? I roll it down halfway. Now 
Pilate's paws are over. And a second later, this whole, he was up to his shoulders, his armpits. Jenny was just saying, John, this is making me nervous. And I was about to say, what? I mean, do you think he's so stupid he's going to jump out of a moving car? <laughs> and just as I said those words, Marley made his big break. <laughs> just went right out the window. I grabbed him with one hand by his big otter tail, and he's dangling with his stomach over the window, his front paw skipping along over the pavement, his giant, unneutered scrotum inches from my face. And I'm holding on to him, and it's right there. And Jenny gets the car stopped in heavy traffic, and she runs around, and she grabs him, and we get him back in the back seat. All the guys, the mechanics at the local gas station, came out to laugh at us. <laughs> By the time we got Marley back in the car, I wasn't feeling too guilty anymore. <laughs> I swear, if I had a pair of scissors on me, <laughs> I would have done that operation right then and there. I got him to the vet, and I said, Doc, give him the works. <laughs> uh, as you can imagine, neutering did eliminate the possibility that there would ever be any Marley Juniors terrorizing the civilized world, but it did little to calm down our emasculated pooch's personality. Neither did the sedatives that the vet prescribed with the advice, don't hesitate to use these. There were these little yellow pills, and uh, we would give them to Marley before a thunderstorm came in, because that's where he had his, his biggest issues. But, you know, you had to really be a weatherman to know when a thunderstorm was going to arrive in an hour, or a half hour. So they didn't really work that well, but they would give him this woe-begone look, his eyes would get bloodshot and hang down. Uh, they didn't do much to slow him down, though. Marley dove through window screens and chewed through the doors. He dug through walls of the kitchen floor. He decapitated our prized hibiscus shrubs. He ate the cones out of the brand new stereo speakers. <laughs> one day I came home and the speakers are perfect, except I noticed one cone is simply missing. They're like somebody had cut it out with a razor blade. The next day I come home and the tweeter speaker's missing. And so it went until the speakers were totally gone. His powerful tail cracked window panes and could clear the coffee table with a single swipe. I can't tell you how many of our prized uh, wine glasses that we got as wedding gifts fell to Marley's tail. One by one, boom, off they went. One day he escaped over the backyard fence and returned three hours later with a pair of giant women's underwear in his teeth. That's the day, like a former president, I initiated the don't ask, don't tell policy. <laughs> I did not want to know where he got those. 